2014. A Montana grad student slides open a storage drawer, finding a three-foot dinosaur claw so bizarre it rewrote paleontology's rulebook. This is the only bone where evolution made a fatal mistake, a weapon that couldn't kill, defend, or even stop destroying its owner. Fossils from the two medicine formation don't just reveal a design flaw, they expose the costliest blunder natural selection ever made. The real mystery? Why evolution built it at all? The drawer slid open with a soft metallic scrape, and for a moment, nobody in the lab said a word. Resting on a faded specimen tag was a claw, curved like a scythe, stretching nearly three feet from base to tip. The graduate researcher who found it stood frozen, hands hovering, unsure whether to laugh, shout, or call security. The claw's arc was so exaggerated, it barely fit within the foam padding. Every ridge, every groove, preserved in the ancient bone, traced a perfect crescent, an impression of scale patterns still visible after 70 million years. The reaction was instant. A text message pinged across the building. Three-foot dino claw in collection. How did we miss this? Within minutes, the hallway outside the prep lab filled with staff, postdocs, even the museum's director. Someone measured the claw against their forearm and shook their head. Another snapped photos for the internal database, but the phone's camera barely captured the whole span. No one could agree what they were looking at. Theropod. Turtle. Something else entirely. The only certainty was that Montana had never produced anything quite like this. The graduate student, still reeling, called the curator. The lab filled with a low hum as the team debated the next step. CT scans were arranged on the spot. There was no protocol for a find this strange. In a collection drawer meant for routine cataloging, evolution had left behind a puzzle so absurd it demanded the full attention of everyone in the building. Montana's two medicine formation stretches across a sweep of badlands and upland ridges, a patchwork of ancient river channels and ash beds, quietly recording the last days of the dinosaurs. What sets this place apart isn't just the quantity of fossils, but the quality of their preservation. Volcanic eruptions, common in the late Cretaceous, blanketed the landscape in fine ash. When a dinosaur died here, it could be buried quickly, sometimes within days, locking bones away from scavengers and decay. That's how the claw and the hand bones attached to it survived 70 million years almost untouched. The Museum of the Rockies, home to the region's most ambitious paleontology teams, has turned these ash-laden layers into a kind of natural archive. Articulated skeletons, bones still joined as they were in life, are rare almost everywhere else, but in Montana, they're found with joint surfaces intact, cartilage impressions still visible, and even the delicate architecture of the claws preserved down to their microscopic texture. Each specimen comes with a paper trail, field notes, GPS coordinates, sketches of the horizon where the bones were found. For researchers, this level of detail is priceless. It means every scan, every measurement, and every diagnosis can be traced directly back to a specific animal in a specific spot in prehistoric time. The museum's infrastructure, high-resolution CT scanners, histology labs, and a staff with decades of field experience, turns these fossils into data. The Montana Claws, in particular, offered something no Asian specimen could, a complete record of how the bones fit together how the joints moved, and, as later scans would reveal, how they failed. In a field where most discoveries are fragments and guesses, Montana's fossils offer answers. CT scans and engineering models left little doubt about the limits of those claws. The first theory to fall was the idea of weaponry. On paper, three-foot blades look intimidating. But under stress testing, the hollow core and thin walls of the Montana Claws revealed the truth. These bones were built for show, not impact. Simulations mapped out color-coded stress points, red zones flaring up with even moderate force. One solid hit, 
the kind needed to fend off a predator, and the claw would snap like a brittle branch. The predicted failure threshold was so low that even a defensive swipe could mean a compound fracture, followed by infection, loss of function, and a slow decline. Defense, then, was a non-starter. Foraging was next on the chopping block. If these claws stripped bark or pulled down branches, there should be evidence of abrasion, worn tips, smooth edges, or micro-scratches from years of contact with wood. Instead, the Montana claws were pristine. The tips ended in sharp, unworn points, with no sign of the kind of grinding seen in true foragers like beavers or ground sloths. Even under magnification, the surface texture was unblemished. The only thing these claws cut through was the air. One engineer summed it up. Three-foot claws on a herbivore are like putting a spoiler on a minivan. It looks dramatic, but it's not helping you win any races or escape any predators. With combat and foraging ruled out, the field narrowed. The next question, could these claws dig? Or were they just evolutionary billboards built to impress? Montana's articulated hand bones closed the book on the digging debate. Measuring the angles where finger met palm, paleontologists found the Therizinosaurus hand locked into a narrow range just 40 to 60 degrees of flexion. That's barely half the motion seen in modern digging specialists. Anteaters and pangolins can curl their claws over 120 degrees, driving them into soil with the force of a jackhammer. The Rizinosaurus, by contrast, could only flex its claws in a shallow arc, the tips forever hovering above the palm. The backward curve, so dramatic in profile, pointed away from any practical use. Try raking gravel with your fingernails, bent backward, and you'll get the idea. Comparative modeling confirmed what the bones suggested. The claw's curvature, averaging 65 to 75 degrees, sweeping away from the hand, contradicted every principle of efficient digging. Modern burrowers have short, forward-arched claws that channel force into the ground. There is in Asaurus's claws were the opposite, long, slender, recurved like scythes, and positioned all wrong for excavation. Even the joint surfaces showed the limits. The digits couldn't bring the claws close to the palm, let alone generate the leverage needed for serious work. With foraging and digging off the table, only one explanation remained. Display. The claws were billboards, not tools. Sexual selection, the evolutionary arms race of who can look the most impressive had run wild. Elk grow antlers so wide they can barely walk through the woods. Peacocks drag around tails twice as long as their bodies. The Rizinosaurus carried three-foot claws it couldn't use for anything but showing off. It's the prehistoric equivalent of putting a spoiler on a lawnmower. Impressive to the neighbors, but not much help when you're actually trying to mow the grass. That verdict display over function, set the stage for the next surprise. The claws weren't just useless, they were hazardous. The hand bones preserved in Montana would soon reveal the price of this evolutionary gamble. Under the microscope, the story written in bone is unmistakable. The Montana claws, so perfect in shape from a distance, reveal a landscape of trauma when magnified. Rings of osteophytes, bony outgrowths, circle the joint margins, evidence of the body's desperate attempt to repair itself. The smooth surface of healthy bone is gone, replaced by ridges and pits where cartilage once cushioned movement. Subchondral erosion, the gradual wearing away of bone just beneath the joint, exposes a raw, uneven texture. These aren't the marks of a single accident. They're the scars of chronic, grinding stress. Cortical bone, the tough outer shell, shows a network of micro-fractures. Some cracks run parallel to the long axis of the claw. Others branch off at sharp angles, forming a web of damage. Thin sections reveal areas where the bone tried to heal, laying down new tissue in ragged, irregular patches known as reactive bone. 
In places, the repair attempts failed entirely, leaving gaps and voids inside the structure. The result is a hand that, by the end of the animal's life, could barely function as intended. Paleopathologists reviewing these slides describe a pattern familiar from modern medicine, severe osteoarthritis. The joint surfaces are deformed, the boundaries between bones blurred by years of inflammation and overuse. In some areas, the articular cartilage is completely gone, replaced by fused bone. The animal would have felt every movement as a grinding, stabbing pain. Even the act of walking or feeding could have triggered fresh micro-injuries, each one compounding the last. The evidence is overwhelming. These claws weren't just oversized ornaments, they were sources of constant suffering. The hand bones from Montana preserve a record of dysfunction, not adaptation. Every ring of new bone, every fracture line, is a silent witness to the cost of evolutionary excess. The animal's body paid for its display with every step, every flex of the hand, until the damage became too great to ignore. Isotope ratios from the Montana claws tell a story of constant metabolic strain. Each year, as growth rings thickened inside those giant bones, Therizinosaurus was pouring energy into a structure that offered no practical return. Bone chemistry hints at cycles of stress spikes in certain elements that match periods of rapid claw growth, followed by signs of nutritional depletion. The numbers, when compared to modern animals with extravagant display features, are staggering. Paleontologists estimate that maintaining and growing those claws could have consumed up to 15 to 20 percent of the animal's daily energy budget. For a human, that's like spending 400 to 500 calories every single day just to keep your fingernails from falling off. The cost wasn't just in calories. Every molecule of calcium, every gram of protein, was diverted from muscle, bone, or immune function to feed the claws relentless growth. During droughts or lean seasons, this metabolic tax became even more punishing. Some years, the growth rings narrow to a thread, the chemical markers for stress spike, and the animal's entire skeleton records the price of evolutionary excess. A paleopathologist who studied these claws summed it up with a kind of dark resignation. If Therizinosaurus had health insurance, it would have been denied for a pre-existing condition, terrible evolutionary design. The evidence points to a hard truth. These claws weren't free. They were a daily drain, a subscription service you couldn't cancel, quietly bleeding energy from every bite of food. When the environment changed, or food ran short, the cost of carrying three-foot ornaments could mean the difference between survival and extinction. The claws didn't just hurt to use, they hurt to keep. Therizinosaur fossils from Montana and Asia reveal a pattern that's hard to ignore. As the claws got bigger, the species themselves didn't last as long. Early forms like Falcarius, living over 100 million years ago, had modest claws, just 15 centimeters, about the length of a large kitchen knife. These dinosaurs stuck around for nearly 20 million years, their fossils showing up across wide stretches of Cretaceous rock. Move forward in time to Nothronicus, with claws reaching 20 centimeters, and the fossil record tightens. The species lasted maybe 5 million years, found in just a handful of layers. Then comes the Rizinosaurus. The Montana and Mongolian specimens show claws up to a full meter long, curving like scythes. But these giants appear in rocks spanning less than 2 million years. For paleontologists, that's a blink. The bigger the claw, the shorter the run. Biologists have charted this inverse relationship, plotting claw length against stratigraphic longevity. The trend line drops off a cliff. Each evolutionary leap in size came with a shrinking window of survival. In practical terms, the claws became a liability faster than the animals could adapt. The same story plays out in other display-heavy species. Irish elk with their unwieldy antlers, peacocks with tails that drag them down. But Therizinosaurus took it to an extreme. No other dinosaur invested so much bone and energy in something so useless. 
A paleontologist once joked, if you want to predict a dinosaur's extinction date, just measure its claws. The data from Montana's two medicine formation and Asian sites back that up. The cost of growing these monstrous appendages wasn't just paid in calories or chronic pain. It was paid in time. The evolutionary clock ran out faster every time the claws got longer. Competition in the late Cretaceous was not a gentle affair. Montana's two medicine formations supported a crowded roster of herbivores, each with its own evolutionary toolkit. Hadrosaurs, with their powerful jaws and battery-like teeth, could process tough vegetation efficiently, browsing in herds that offered safety in numbers. Ceratopsians, armored with horns and frills, relied on bulk and defense, not display. Ankylosaurs brought literal armor plating to the table, and even the smallest ornithopods could bolt for cover when danger appeared. In this landscape, every calorie counted, and every anatomical feature had to earn its keep. The Rhizinosaurus, burdened by its massive claws, faced a different equation. Resource partitioning studies from the two medicine beds show that hadrosaurs and ceratopsians exploited a wider range of plants, from low-growing ferns to tough conifers. Their dental batteries and jaw mechanics allowed them to grind through material that would have been off-limits to a therizinosaur, whose beak and leaf-shaped teeth were built for selectivity, not versatility. When drought struck or seasons shifted, Generalists had options. Specialists, locked into a narrow dietary niche, found themselves outmaneuvered. Energy economics sealed the disadvantage. While hadrosaurs could convert nearly every bite into usable fuel, Therizinosaurus was locked into a metabolic arms race with its own skeleton. The cost of growing, maintaining, and repairing three-foot claws meant less energy for growth immune defense, or reproduction. In lean years, this metabolic penalty became a liability. Isotope chemistry from Montana fossils reveals stress markers in the resinosaur bone that spike during periods of environmental hardship, evidence of a body stretched to its limits by evolutionary excess. Ecological models suggest that as environmental pressures mounted, the balance tipped further. Herbivores with lower overhead those that didn't waste energy on ornamental structures, endured the squeeze. Their Azinosaurus, already running a daily deficit, became increasingly vulnerable. The fossil record is clear. When the climate tightened its grip, it was the efficient, not the extravagant, that survived. In the end, the claws that once defined their Azinosaurus as unique became the anchors that pulled it under. In 2014, a three-foot claw from Montana's two medicine formation forced paleontologists to confront a hard truth. Evolution does not guarantee improvement. Biomechanical analysis, CT scans, and isotope studies show the Rhizinosaurus claws were too fragile for combat, too pristine for foraging, and too awkward for digging. Pathology reports reveal chronic arthritis, healed fractures, and a daily metabolic cost estimated at 15 to 20 percent of total energy, facts linked directly to the claw's size. Yet, the original purpose of these claws, likely display, is not fully confirmed, as no direct evidence of mating behavior survives. Today, scientists note similar evolutionary trade-offs in modern animals, from peacock tails to human spines. The Montana fossils remain a warning. Natural selection rewards what works now, not what lasts. The fate of Therizinosaurus proves that sometimes, evolutionary success comes at a price too high for survival.